from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Coming up today, K-State's Greg Hanselcheck will go over the health management aspect of a preconditioning program for fall weaned beef calves. He'll talk about the essential vaccination and parasite control measures to follow there. Then excerpts from this week's Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State, where Brad White, Bob Larson, and Bob Weber will cover information presented at the recent K-State Ranching Summit, and they'll talk about calf ration management as part of a preconditioning program. Later, K-State's Charlie Lee takes a look at a new study of pocket gopher control products, which may show the way to better management of these damaging rodents. All that and more right here on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test fix save a life this message brought to you by the kansas radon program the kansas association of broadcasters and this station you're listening to agriculture today once again thanks for joining us Our first segment for you beef cattle producers who have calves soon to be weaned, we're going to look at the value and the process of preconditioning those calves. Joining us once more to talk bovine health management is Greg Hanselcheck. He's the director of the Production Animal Field Investigations Unit with the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here at K-State. This is the time, Greg, to get into preconditioning and, and what it brings to the table for the producer. But defining it, well... That tends to flex a little bit, you say. It really does. We've thrown the word preconditioning out there for 50, 60 years, but there really isn't a definition of it in the in the beef industry. I mean, there's some people that think that that means you, you vaccinate the calves before weaning, and then on the day of weaning, you load them on the truck and they go to the sale barn. There's actual set up weaning programs and, and those are usually designed so that you do your vaccination and everything but you keep those calves for at least 45 days on the operation before you market them at the sale barn or the or the feed yards those are the two when you hear preconditioning people think of the one that's sometimes battered around that we're pretty sure isn't preconditioning is when you vaccinate the calves as they're loaded on the truck to go to the sale barn that that's not really preconditioning i don't know what the word is but that that would not be preconditioning it lacks for planning is what you're saying exactly and uh, again one can customize that preconditioning program to meet their herd goals that's exactly right and, and one of the common programs is you vaccinate two to four weeks before weaning then you vaccinate on the day of weaning there's some that say, well, let's let's vaccinate at weaning and then let's wait two to four weeks and, and re-booster it two to four weeks after that. So there's a lot of different options that, that uh, producers can use. And, and if they use their veterinarian's advice, there's probably a program that works for them. But you say it all revolves around two principles, maximizing the immunity to disease issues and minimizing the stress on those calves. That's exactly right. That, that's what preconditioning does. We use the vaccinations to boost the immunity. We, we want to make sure these calves are dewormed. The internal parasites are killed because those internal parasites have a negative effect on immunity. Those are the kind of things we want to boost immunity. Good diet, those kind of things will maximize immunity. Reducing stress is pretty difficult because there are so many stresses that these calves are going through. But there are some things that one can do to at least chip away at that stress. But let's stay on the disease side for the moment as part of this health management approach. What diseases in a preconditioning program typically should the cow-calf producer go after? Well, the big one is respiratory disease. So we're talking about bovine respiratory disease. That's always the, that is the number one post-weaning disease that that we deal with in in the cattle industry. So that's number one. That'd be your, basically your uh, respiratory viruses, your IBRs, your BBD and BRSB. And then there's another one. It's It's a whole group of organisms, the clostridiums. We talk about a black leg, and we can see in that class, there's a whole bunch of diseases that this organism causes, and that's the seven way that we typically use. That's the other actual disease that we're going to try to manage through vaccination. 
So no matter what preconditioning program one's employing, those two potential conditions should be addressed across the board. Absolutely. There, there isn't any vaccination program or anything that anybody in the whole United States can use. But concentrating on those two classes, the respiratory and the clostridiums, is, uh, it's for everybody. As far as administering those, Greg, is there a, a timeline one should follow? There, there really isn't. We just Our ultimate goal is to have the booster vaccine in the animal two to four weeks prior to when we expect them to actually be exposed to those organisms. So that's why a lot of times we do want those calves to be vaccinated two to four weeks prior to weaning. And then the day of weaning, because it's it's in that first couple of weeks after weaning when these calves are at the highest risk for respiratory disease. We speak of the vaccine protocols frequently, but th- that parasite control is equally important here, you say? It is. Uh, th- those calves are, they've been out in pasture and the worms are passed through the cows, getting the grass, the calves consume the grass and they become infected with internal parasites. And we know that those worms have a huge negative impact on their immunity. So it's important that when we do wean them, that we also use a product that does really good to to reduce the number of internal parasites those calves have. And the dewormer of choice, porons, injectables, does it matter? It does matter. It matters a lot because we're seeing so much resistance in particularly one class, but certain classes of dewormers, we're starting to see worm resistance. So it is important that the producer work with their veterinary to decide, do I need an oral? Do I need a pour on? What product do I need before they just they just start deworming their calves? Right. But pay special attention and allow for the needs of those calves in particular, separate from the cow herd when it comes to parasite control. Exactly. And there's a, there's a way, we call it the fecal egg count reduction test, that if producers want to know whether their product is working, there's a simple laboratory test they can do to determine how effective the product actually is. Now, they go hand-in-hand, hand, disease and parasite control and uh, minimizing stress, but there are other things in the management sense that producers can do to lessen that stress, and that uh, could be any number of things, including the method of weaning, of course. Exactly. I mean, when we talk about stresses, there isn't really a good definition of that either, but a stress is anything that is going to reduce the immune level of that calf, and just the process of weaning, taking the calf away from the mother – that have been together for five, six, seven months is, is a huge stressor. So people do the fence line weaning. Uh, some will put the devices in the nose so that the calves can't nurse. Those things really help reduce the separation part of the weaning. It minimizes that. You say adding to that, being careful about when you process those calves, which is another source of stress, and maybe timing that out so that uh, the stress doesn't build intensely all at once. Yeah, and, and the two huge stressors for these calves are dehorning and castration. So uh, it is really highly recommended that those two procedures, if needed to be done on the calves, be done as early in life as possible. The earlier in life as possible, the less stress, the, the less repercussions you're going to have from, from those types of operations. So you don't want weaning and dehorning castration all to happen on the same day. <laughs> those are operations, if they practice that, which are successful ones out there, they're at a much, much higher risk of having health issues if they're, if they're adding those things together at the same time. And that uh, young calf is making a switch in its nutritional uh, plane to something that isn't mother's milk. So creep feeding is often part of a preconditioning protocol, is it? It is. It's, it's highly recommended because it gets those calves used to eating a dry uh, pelleted feed. Uh, and, it, and it does work. It's it's not always economical to do that. It's not. It's not for everybody. That's a. That's a process that that we use to help those calves transition from drinking milk and eating green grass, and to now they're going to be eating uh, harvested forages and grains and eating out of a bunk. And you're bunk breaking them at the same time. There's an idea out there that you say producers might want to consider a mentor animal to help those calves acclimate. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's it's uh, there's research out there, and some shows positive benefits, some show no benefits. But basically, the idea is that in the pen of weaned calves, you put an older animal and let that animal actually teach those calves where's the bunk, and and a lot of it is where's the water. Mm-hmm. There is some pretty good research that shows that does help calves transition during the weaning period to have that 
mentor out there in that pen. What, Greg, does research tell us about the benefits of preconditioning? In other words, what is that producer gaining from carrying out this program? For it does require a little extra investment and labor. Exactly. It, it's probably not for everybody because it takes facilities, it takes labor, and then if producers are keeping their calves 45 days after weaning, they're at a higher risk of disease because they have the calves longer. But research is pretty clear that a true preconditioning program does reduce bovine respiratory disease, does help with feed efficiency and average daily gain in calves that actually go through those programs. Now, the question of whether there is an economic premium attached to preconditioning calves, well, that is also something that varies as you go around the countryside. That's exactly right. There's some really good uh, video auction data that, that shows that producers that do truly precondition the 45-day vac and those kind of things do get a premium. Uh, there's other people that have looked at it, and especially in the normal way we sell calves through a sale barn that, that wonder if uh, the preconditioning calves are actually getting a premium or actually the calves that are at high-risk calves that are going through the sale barn are just getting discounted. Mm-hmm. And so you get that price spread. So I don't it's know. point of debate. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. The, the idea of preconditioning makes sense. We're doing everything we can to minimize stress and, and boost immunity. But again, it it's not for everybody. I mean, I wish it was, but it, it really isn't. Well, at the very minimum, a producer should have a dialogue with their local herd veterinarian uh, assembling a program that works for the herd. Absolutely. I would highly recommend that the producers use their veterinarian to pick the vaccine, pick the, the dewormers, and the timing. Sit down with the veterinarian and say, this is our program. When would be the best time that we could actually get these products and these animals to to maximize our effectiveness of of spending this money on these calves? And for those spring-born calves, the time is here to contemplate the merits of a preconditioning program and to start carrying that program out, if that's the choice. And Greg, we always appreciate the comments and the input. Thank you. Thank you. Greg Hanselcheck, over from the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory at K-State. And we'll be back with more. This is Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Next up on Agriculture Today, highlights from another installment of the BCI Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State. At the table this week, K-State veterinarians Bob Larson and Brad White, and returning to the fold, cow-calf specialist Bob Weber. He'll chime in about a recent informational event at K-State with Brad triggering the discussion. Tell us a little bit about the Ranching Summit, what it was, who attended... Yeah, great. Thanks, Brad. Um, so yeah, last Wednesday, the 15th of August, was the Ranching Summit here. Uh, we had that event at the uh, Alumni Center put on by our um, beef extension team here uh, at K-State. And, and we started the Ranching Summit a couple of years ago to really address sort of the management and business climate needs of cow-calf producers. Um, in extension, we spend a lot of time talking about you know nutritional strategies and reproductive management strategies and cropping strategies, all those sort the, of technical the stuff pieces. I need to do this week. Right. Um, but we don't spend a lot of time typically thinking about sort of the next level of managerial stuff above that in terms of the management of a ranch or, or farm. And so we, we designed it this year to, to really take on a few topics that we thought were pretty timely. The focus was Beef 2030, uh, Technology, Transparency, and Sustainability. And so we had a, a variety of speakers um, to address uh, different aspects of, of that set of topics. Uh, Mark Gardner from uh, Gardner Angus down at Ashland came and talked about their family's business philosophy related to uh, technology adoption and kind of how they manage that. Tyson 
Tyson Johnson from Sooner Cattle Company in Oklahoma, a big cow calf and stalker operator, I came and talked about a really important business topic, one that maybe people don't get very excited about, but was what are some of the managerial accounting numbers that we need? So we spend typically, if you're a sizable operation, somebody in your organization does or should spend a fair bit of time taking care of the the fiscal sort of position of the ranch, but how do you take those numbers and drive them into management decisions? Yeah, do more than just get your taxes done. Right, right. Yeah, you really need to leverage that information to make good fiscal decisions. Tom Field from uh, up at uh, University of Nebraska came and talked about sort of disruptive technologies and, and how, as businesses and agriculture, how do we think about those and manage those as they change our business models in, in many ways. Um, we had Can you some, give, give some examples? What was, um, what was so some, some, of the, some of the examples uh, that he pointed out were things like a little bit of discussion about blockchain. We've talked about blockchain, but mm-hmm. as a way of, of moving information and money around and adding to a transparency layer in our business, uh, a lot about various digital technologies. So, you know, we've seen a proliferation of uh, precision ag applied in cropping systems, but not much in in livestock. And and I think we're right on the cusp of a bunch of those technologies getting pushed into particularly cow-calf and feedlot production. Uh, Some other speakers, uh, we had uh, three that had K-State connections. Uh, Megan Rolf uh, from Animal Science is a a, a genetics genomics person, talked about genome editing technologies and how that might be incorporated into a whole host of technologies on the genetics and reproductive management front. Um, One of the, the amazing things is, you know, we can turn two or three generations of seed stock animals without ever producing a calf, which kind of makes your head spin a little bit. Um, But that technology is available today, maybe not cost effective, but we can sure, at least in the experimental realm, do that. So what do you you Um, mean by that? Explain that a little bit more. So basically taking germplasm or embryos and, and semen, doing in vitro fertilization, developing a cell line from that fertilization, genotype that cell line to figure out amongst the cell lines I just produced, which one's the best. So I don't have to have a bunch of calves born and test them. I can just look at all the embryos that I created and and evaluate them. And basically integrating that process with somatic cell nuclear transfer to shortcut the production of calves. So you can do two or three generations of production without ever producing a calf. And then once you get to where you want to do, you do a somatic cell nuclear transfer, produce a whole set of clones. Interesting thing. And you calf them out and you could do all that in a 12 month time window. Interesting thing is you actually mentioned several new technologies that have, that are from different time areas. You've got artificial insemination and embryo transfer, which are not new not anymore. New. They're not old, but, but not new, right? Exactly. Yeah. And then you add to that, the cell transfer, which is uh, a decade or so old, and yep. and then you've got some of the genomic work, which is even newer than that, yep. kind of stacked on each other. So, yep. And the, the 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 bit that she added in was in that process, you can genome edit. So you can take it in the process of building the cell line to somatic cell nuclear transfer, you can edit those the genomes in that process to fix a genetic defect or insert a new gene, all kinds of uh, interesting applications there. Uh, Luis Mendonca, uh, a dairy extension specialist in our group, has built a benchmarking and collaborative network of dairies across Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, Oklahoma. Again, kind of a, a big data. A big data application, really, and, and using that to better understand and sort of the interaction between climate, temperature, and reproduction in dairy cows and how to manage that and get better at that um, over time. So a, a really interesting application there. And then Ray Azebedo, a uh, former faculty member in agronomy and precision ag, has now gone to work for a technology company, um, principally development of technology to attach to drones for agronomic data collection. That, that was an interesting talk to me just because of how fast some of that drone technology has Evolved. He showed a drone from two years ago versus one today, and the increased capabilities in just a couple of years. Phenomenal, yeah. Again, it's had a lot of crop applications, but they're starting to find some some cattle applications as well. Yeah, and really that progression in in drones. One of the things that that really stuck out to me in in Ray's talk was the movement from sort of the octocopter rotary wing 
drones with limited flight time to some fixed wing aircraft. Yeah, they look like little airplanes. They look like little airplanes. And you can send them out on a mission that's a much longer duration, heavier payload, so more sensor data um, to capture to do specific tasks. So, so pretty they're nice. starting to be able to find and count, count cattle cows, which is crazy. over the hill, right. which I think would be great That'd on be a lot awesome. of days. One speaker we, we left off the list, the capstone one really, was John Butler from mm-hmm. uh, Beef Management Group here in Manhattan talked about what his vision was for the industry moving forward. And many of you already know, John's uh, deeply involved in in the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And so he talked a lot about sort of transparency, um, traceability issues in our business, and and really understanding, you know, how do we connect with consumers and and pulling all those pieces together. And so he did did a great job, too. People may want to find, we recorded all this stuff. So um, if you go to the ksubeef.org website, um, find Ranching Summit, or if you go to the Department of Animal Science YouTube channel, there's a whole playlist of all the talks, and you can capture those and and download them and watch them, and it's uh, really great content. Absolutely, and we'll put that website in the show notes, so you'll be able to easy to get to that. Another thing that we wanted to talk about as as we go through, and that sounds like it was a great conference, Bob, last week we talked some about weaning calves, preconditioning. What we did not touch on was getting those calves started on feed. So after they're weaned, any tips or hints for how do we get them started on feed or at the time of weaning? Yeah, and what I'm going to say is is a lot of things that I learned from my clients and some that I saw that that did very well getting calves started on feed. And usually we're talking about calves that they weaned on their ranch, but sometimes it's it's calves they bought and brought in. But a lot of it has to do, you go back to some of the real basics. Make sure you've got plenty of bunk space because some of these calves aren't very competitive. Make sure that the, the feed is fairly recognizable for them. So classic is, is a long stem hay, something that, that's fairly identifiable and, and something that they'll come to the bunk and start eating. And the other thing I would say is some of your better quality. So this is the place to, to really have something that's palatable, uh, that will attract them. A couple other things that sometimes people forget about is making sure you have enough water. Uh, a couple of times when I, I've been caught making a mistake in this area is um, say an operation increases the number of calves that they have or purchased and didn't increase the water capacity. That might be the size of the tank. It might be the size or the capacity of the well to deliver water. And so it's, it's not real obvious that there's no water it's just not enough water to get the kind of performance and health that we want. So I'd really start with the basics. Plenty of bunk space, good, clean, dry ground for them to be on, and make sure you've got plenty of water. And then on the feed side, palatable, nutrient-dense, good quality. Those are the starting places for me. And we're working them up till they're eating a couple percent of their body weight, or what's your, what's your target there? Yeah, I, you start usually at less than that. You're talking probably percent or less. But I want to get them up to 2% of their body weight pretty soon. And, again, that's going to take a, a palatable ration that, that they're really attracted which to. Is, which is combined, that 2% is combined hay and any other feed that you might be feeding. And, the, and then you work them up, and you can keep track of what you're delivering um, look, are they eating it all or not? So I yeah. think those are good tips going in. That, that reminds me, I saw a, a post on uh, a couple of different posts, people putting calves on feed and asking about, well, how much should they eat? And the numbers were all over the board, like start them on 3% concentrate. That's, wow. Right? Wow. <laughs> um, don't do that, folks. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, 2% uh, on a dry matter basis for particularly you know four or five weight calves if you get them to eat two percent, you're doing pretty well. Particularly if it's a you know a lot of brome hay or mm-hmm. long stem. Two uh, percent total consumption, yeah. not concentrate. Not concentrate, maybe a, a, a half a percent of concentrate um, to start with, and something that's you probably need to be in the 16, 18 percent crude protein. Yeah, that's that nutrient. Glasses on it, something really palatable to get them to if they've not been exposed to feed before. Just to get them to the bottom. Yeah, I'm assuming that they're not going to eat real well, so I need a fairly nutrient dense. So fairly, you know, a little bit of a, you know, a concentrate or something like that, and then the hay has to be pretty good quality because I want, I know they're not going to eat as much as they will later, and so I need the every every bite they eat to have quite a bit of nutrient in it. Yep. Thanks for joining us this week, and we look forward to talking to you next week. Bob Weber, Bob Larson, and Brad White of K-State hear the entire BCI Cattle Chat podcast at beefcattleinstitute.org. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. 
It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. To today's agricultural news headlines, now courtesy in part of DTN. And looking at the Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report for this week out from the USDA yesterday for the week ending this past Sunday. Our topsoil moisture supplies in the state now 6% surplus, 77% adequate, 17% short to very short. And subsoil moisture supplies at 2% surplus, 74% adequate now, and 24% still short to very short. The condition of the Kansas corn crop this week, 46% good to excellent, 27% fair, and 27% poor to very poor. Corn in the dough stage at 92%, that's near the average, and in the dent, 71% ahead of the 54% average. Corn mature now at 23%, that's ahead of the 11% average for the date, and the corn harvest is 2% complete. The soybean crop in Kansas, 49% good to excellent, 34% fair, and 17% poor to very poor. Soybean setting pods at 89%, that's ahead of the 79% average. And soybean stands dropping leaves at 4%, that's very near the average. Grain sorghum condition, 68%, good to excellent, 25% fair, 7% poor to very poor. Sorghum headed, 93%, near the average, and sorghum coloring, 38%, ahead of the 30% average. Grain sorghum now mature at 3%, that's near the average. And range in pasture conditions this week, 39% good to excellent, 33% fair, 28% for a poor to very poor around the state of Kansas. Well, you commodity farmers can expect to collect a combined $4.7 billion in trade aid payments from the USDA, that's nationally. Soybean farmers receiving the bulk of those funds as the USDA is working to spread that money around based on retaliatory trade tariffs against U.S. farm commodities. USDA leaders announced more details of the trade aid package yesterday. Sign-up starts a week from today, September the 4th, but you'll have to show actual production for or fall harvested crops, beans, corn, sorghum, and cotton, before you can sign up for those aid checks. The heart of that aid program, the market facilitation payments, will total $4.7 billion. It'll be based on 50% of a farmer's production this year for the commodity. That 50% figure multiplied by payment rates, soybeans at $1.65 per bushel, sorghum $0.86 cents per bushel, wheat at $0.14 cents per bushel, corn $0.01 cent per bushel, and cotton at $0.06 cents a pound. Pork producers will also be paid $8 a head for 50% of the pigs they owned as of August the 1st. And dairy farmers will be receiving a payment based on the Margin Protection Program historical production figure multiplied by 12 cents per hundredweight to calculate that payment. For dairy farmers who are not in the MPP and don't have that number, the USDA does have alternative ways to come up with that calculation. To be eligible, one must have an adjusted gross income under $900,000 and be in conservation compliance. The aid payments will have a cap of $125,000 per person, but that cap will also be separate from any payments that one might receive from the agricultural risk coverage or price loss coverage programs. Payments could go out within weeks for producers once the crops are harvested and they sign up for the aid. On tomorrow's broadcast, we'll welcome in the State Director of the Farm Service Agency here in Kansas, David Shim, for more particulars on this assistance. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and now the weekly feature for you dairy producers from the Animal Sciences and Industry Department here at K-State Milk Lines with K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning some things to consider as we finish the silage chopping season. As we begin packing bunker silos and drive over piles, there's some things that we need to keep in mind 
One of those really important things is the amount of soil that we might mix in with the plant material as we do this process. Some reasons why we are becoming more concerned about this is the fact that in our dairy herds, oftentimes we have a situation where we see animals that develop a bacterial infection in their digestive system. This results in some blood in the stools and in severe cases actually can result in the death of the animal. Much of this activity has been tied to a certain bacteria, Clostridia perfringens, which is endemic in the soil. So if we mix soil with our plant materials as we build our drive over piles and bunker silos, that means that there is a chance that some of our animals may develop this infection from this bacteria and can be a very severe situation on our dairies. So what can we do to prevent that? Well, number one, if we can build drive over piles and put floors into our bunker silos, that will eliminate much of the dirt that we tend to mix in during the packing and building process of the silage mass. Now, some other things we can consider to do if we are going to be packing silage on dirt, whether it be the dirt floor of a bunker silo or the dirt underneath a drive over pile, is to be just very, very careful as we push that silage mass together. So during the packing process, making sure that when we dump loads of silage at the end of the bunker silo or at the end of the drive over pile, making sure that we're dumping that on a silage layer that's already across the dirt. And then being careful that we do not dig into the dirt as we push up the face of the silo. That will help reduce the amount of dirt that we mix in in this process. Now, we also need to think about this in terms of corn silage as well as haylage because you can get the same sort of situation in haylage. Now, what are some other things that we can do? Well, we also know that sometimes these bacteria will multiply in the silo. This generally occurs when we have plant material that's been packed in too dry. So making sure that we harvest at the right moisture content will help reduce the numbers of bacteria that might grow in the silage mass. Now, what are some things we can do on feed out? There are some things that we can consider feeding as additives to help the animals combat the bacterial load that they might be facing. There are some biological materials that can be fed. These are generally direct fed microbials, which have shown some evidence to have some control of some of the Clostridia perfringens. There's also some binders that sometimes help with some of the toxic substances that these organisms produce. Again, not heavily proven, but does seem to help in some cases. And there's also vaccinations that we can give our animals that help protect them from Clostridia perfringens. Mike Brook there with this week's Milk Lines. Thanks, Mike. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Next up on Agriculture Today, K-State Research and Extension Wildlife Specialist Charlie Lee stops by for his weekly visit on wildlife management. Charlie, we've had the chance in the past to talk about pocket gophers and the headaches they cause. We're going to have an update here on pocket gopher control, but their presence can be more than just a nuisance. It certainly can. Pocket gophers can cause damage to agricultural crops and rangeland resources, as well as forest, woodland areas, that really requires some level of management. Uh, Most of the damage that I hear about is when pocket gophers are in a perennial crop like alfalfa or perhaps clover. Um, Most of the time it's in commercial production uh, alfalfa fields. And the damage there is um, from thinning the stands of alfalfa as pocket gophers eat the roots. 
but most of the damage occurs for the pocket gopher's habit of building a mound where they're getting rid of excess dirt from their tunnel. That mound then causes the hay operator to raise the mower so you're not be able to cut as low as they would like to. So it can result in um, up to 10% of the yield of hay off of that particular field when they have to raise it higher to avoid plugging the sickle or damaging the, the mower or swather. So people that are raising alfalfa, have a, certainly have a definite problem with pocket gophers. There's also a few people that are still doing flood irrigation and those that are irrigating out of canals. Pocket gophers then are damaging those by tunneling through areas and cause a breach and water leaks in those situations. For those people that are using drip irrigation, that's not a lot of them. Again, pocket gophers are very damaging to that as they will chew through the tape or those tubes that are underground. Background, if you would, on our means of control. There have been, for instance, a number of products out there for for pocket gopher management, have there not? The primary control options for pocket gopher include trapping uh, or baiting with rodenticides. Burrow fumigation for pocket gophers is allowed with certain products, including aluminum and magnesium phosphide, but fumigation with CO2 or carbon dioxide is not allowed in Kansas. So both trapping and baiting with rodenticides can be highly effective at reducing pocket gopher damage, but it's not really consistent, particularly with the rodenticides. Trapping is not looked at very often in large landscapes, uh, including large alfalfa fields, because it's very time-consuming and it seems to be more costly Uh, when we look at labor costs compared to baiting. So baiting is the the approach that most growers, pest control professionals utilize to control pocket gophers. And the preferred bait, if you will, the toxicant products that uh, seem to work, what do we know? Well, there are three baits that are used to control pocket gophers, strychnine, zinc phosphide, and the first-generation anticoagulants, which would include things like chlorofacinone and difacinone. Uh, Those products uh, are still out there and available. Strychnine is an acute toxicant that's been widely used uh, to control pocket gophers. It's a preferred bait in some areas because of the acute toxicity. It has a more palatable flavor than zinc phosphide, and strychnine in many trials, comes out a little more efficacious than zinc phosphide. But in some areas, pocket gophers seem to have developed a resistance to strychnine baits, and people that are interested in controlling pocket gophers are looking for alternatives to strychnine since it's also becoming more difficult to import to the U.S. The supply is limited. seems to be some resistance to strychnine, so... Producers are looking for other options. So what I'd like to report on today would be a research report that looked at alternative rodenticide baits that would replace strychnine for controlling pocket gophers. You say this analysis was conducted in the state of California, and not only did it look at these particular products individually, but it looked at combinations of products? Yeah, I think that's one of the unique things about this particular report is that it looked at combination of rodenticides. Most rodenticide products, the toxicants themselves, are single-dose active ingredients. But this particular project looked at some cage trials of pocket gophers. They're actually a different species of pocket gopher than we have here in Kansas. But I think the effect of the, the rodenticides would be very similar regardless of the species of pocket gopher we're discussing. So I think these results could be applicable here to Kansas. They used uh, some of the acute rodenticides that are out there. Then they used combination rodenticides, uh, and those combinations would be including the first-generation anticoagulant rodenticides. The results were somewhat surprising to me in that the combinations provided the best control uh, that was the best overall, and it averaged more than 90% efficacy. 
Typically, when I do a trial looking at the use of rodenticides for pocket gophers, if I get anything over that 70 to 80 percent range, I think it's an excellent result. Uh, but most of the time, it's not any better than that. And seldom are we getting that 90 percent plus control rate. And with the cost of labor, uh, most people want the most efficacious project that they can get. So I think this idea of looking at some of these baits in combination certainly has merit, but there's still a lot of research yet to do. Remember, this was a cage study. I think the first step then would be to take this to the field and look at efficacy under field conditions. And to stress further, these combinations are not yet cleared for approval legally. They're not labeled. No, these these would have been uh, combination active ingredients that were formulated into the bait at the time that it was applied. They used both granular and pelleted combinations. But again, I think there's lots of things uh, to look at in the development of a new rodenticide, but it shows, at least early on, that these combination of rodenticides might be the wave of the future. Very well. We will watch for progress in that area of improved alternatives for controlling pocket gophers, which do remain a, a prominent rodent problem in Kansas and elsewhere. Charlie, thanks. Charlie Lee, Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. That's our Tuesday edition. Thanks for being along with us once again. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.